Okay. Uh, thanks. So I'd really like to thank uh, Juha and Robert for the kind invitation to come back here again two and a half years later. Uh, now it's all feeling very deja vu-like. So that's good. Um, and I congratulate you on this great meeting. So I want to give you some of my perspectives as a physician scientist who runs a wet lab in terms of trying to find new ways to prevent gastric cancer. So we've seen this Correa cascade repeatedly here at this meeting, which I don't need to go into, but I just want to point out the way I think about this is when we're talking about non-atrophic gastritis, what efforts can we make to understand host pathogen interactions, which is crucial because H. pylori is the uh, driving force for gastric cancer. And then what, once we have IM of the complete and incomplete type, what can we do to prevent the disease progression? So uh, Blanca already introduced the idea of the Columbia Chemo Prevention Cohort. I just want to mention a few additional things. So Blanca spearheaded actually two papers in, tw in 2018 in gut and 2021 in gastro, uh, looking at the 16-year and 20-year follow-up. So this was originally a trial that Dr. Paleo Correa organized that began in 1991, and it started with 800 patients that were randomized in the high-risk region, the high-altitude zone of Columbia, and they were randomized to various interventions or placebo, which included antibiotics as well as some antioxidants, and there were publications that came out at the six-year data and the 12-year um, uh, data, and the main point is that although it wasn't originally planned that way, the idea came about to continue to follow these patients as sort of a natural uh, epidemiologic study. And at the 16-year time point, there were over 400 patients, and at the 20-year, over 300, and Blanc is actually writing up the year 26 endoscopy results right now. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out from the gut paper in 2018 on this question about, okay, if you treat patients with antibiotics, is there a sustained benefit? And I, as Dr. Kuiper said in his talk today, that's an accepted idea. But one of the nuances in this chemoprevention study is that patients had repeat endoscopies at the uh, six-year, uh, 12 year, 16, 20, and now year 26. So therefore, we have data about their histology and their H. pylori status. And in this region, people are at high risk of getting reinfected. And so what these data show in this uh, model is that if they were persistently negative of H. pylori at 12 and 16 years, they had regression in their histopathology score. And it was kind of not so much if they were partly positive, partly negative, and um, the main point is if they were positive at 12 and 16 years, they had progression of the histologic lesions. So most of the studies don't give you this kind of follow-up information. And then in the year 20 data that Blanca published in Gastro, there's a separation of the curves here such that if in the red line, if there was H. pylori positivity, the histopathology score was worse than if they were negative. And this means at each of these time points what their status was. And statistically, there was a modest but significant benefit in the uh, score if they were negative compared to positive. And so one of the things that uh, came out of this study, Blanca today talked about the incomplete IM, but there was also this notion that I found really interesting, which was that if you look at the baseline diagnosis, all of the patients that were found to progress to cancer uh, had IM or dysplasia at baseline. Now, in the Dr. Correa's study, at the earlier time points, whenever you look at those forest plots, his study was always the one that it wasn't really easy to see a benefit in cancer, or there was no benefit. This was a recent paper from 2019 published by the group from Shandong, China, and they did a, this was the 22-year follow-up of an intervention study in which they used eradication or vitamins or garlic, and actually the vitamins also uh, led to a benefit in addition to H. pylori. The, this was a very highly powered study. You can see the denominators are way over 1,000 subjects that were followed for this long time period. 
So, but there was actually no benefit in all-cause mortality. So that's an interesting question. Okay, let's get into some scientific methodology. So in my lab, uh, one of the areas that I work on is polyamines. And what we found was that uh, this was a very vital pathway to study. So very briefly, the amino acid ornithine is converted by the rate-limiting enzyme ornithine decarboxylase for polyamine synthesis. And the first polyamine is putrescine, which is converted to spermidine and spermine by various synthases. And we used the drug alpha ornithine or DFMO, in an NCI-funded R01 trial uh, that I've done with Doug Morgan, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And we're also very interested in an enzyme called spermine oxidase, and I'm going to show you a bunch of our data on that. And SMOX back converts spermine into spermidine. And it's important because polyamine homeostasis is critical to survival of all organisms, and we know that there's a problem, which is that when spermine is back converted to spermidine, it generates hydrogen peroxide and another uh, reactive molecule called acrolein, which is downstream of this 3-amino propanol. We're very interested in this as a therapeutic target, and we've used a couple of different drugs for this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, about 10 years ago, we developed this conceptual model in which we argued that H. pylori activates spermine oxidase and it may be CAG A dependent, and this generates oxidative stress, but now we're really interested in this generation of this reactive acrolein. Um, ornithine decarboxylase is a target that can be blocked by the DFMO. As I said, we've also looked at EGF receptor signaling, and that this EGFR activation leads to survival of cells with damaged DNA. So um, one of our key papers came from the high-risk and low-risk regions of Columbia, and basically what we showed in this paper in 2015 was that SMOX was upregulated, especially in areas of intestinal metaplasia in the high-risk patients. And we also showed DNA damage, nuclear staining. And the main point of this figure is that when we quantified all of this immunohistochemistry, that at each stage of the disease along the cascade, the patients from the high-risk region had more spermine oxidase and more DNA damage shown on this correlation plot. What we did is we developed gerbil-adapted strains of H. pylori from these patients, and we found that a strain that we made that um, was successful in colonizing gerbils led to dysplasia in this 50-56 this gerbil-adapted strain. Here's penetrating glands indicative of adenocarcinoma, and the low-risk strain was associated more with dysplasia, and you can see the radical difference uh, in, in these high and low risk strains. And then we again recapitulated the idea that spermine oxidase was more abundant in epithelial cells isolated from uh, these gerbils. So then we did an intervention study in these animals and we used the gerbil model because these animals get carcinoma. And we found in the um, bars here that DFMO, we were able to reduce the H. pylori induced polyamine synthesis. And this was the key data right here that led to the funding of our clinical trial, which was that when we looked at dysplasia in the blue and cancer in the red, that the DFMO shown in this first bar reduced both by about 50 percent, and the combination with the SMOX inhibitor MDL72527 had a very modest additive effect. And MDL is not available for human use. So uh, with the help of NCI and Asad Umar's support, we did a clinical trial. But one of the th funny things that happened along the way is we noticed that in um, gerbils colonized with a 7.13 H. pylori strain that uh, when we did an analysis of the phosphorylation of CAG-A, so we took the output strains grown out of animals infected for 8 to 12 weeks and then expose those to a reporter system in which you add them to AGS, gastric cells, and you do Western blotting for phospho-CAG-A, you can see that in eight animals that did not get DFMO, all of the strains uh, caused some activation of CAG-A phosphorylation, whereas in about half of the strains from the DFMO-treated animals, these output strains had lost their ability to cause phosphorylation of the oncoprotein CAG-A. This was related to about a 50% reduction in cancer, as we published in the earlier paper. 
not a significant difference in inflammation, but the translocation index, as I showed you here, was decreased. NF-kappa B activity was decreased, as was expression of the gene encoding for IL-8. We found in this study that when we did uh, analysis of the uh, gene CAGY by restriction fragment length polymorphism analysis, that here's the parental strain, and you just look at the pattern of these bands. The output strain that we call DFMO4 from the fourth gerbil had a totally different pattern, as did DFMO8 was different. And then when we complemented the parental strain with these, the CAGY from these two, we were able to get the same appearance and we were able to show in vitro that we lost the phosphorylation of CAG-A and we saw an alteration in the CAG-Y protein appearance. So we were set up to say, okay, now we have an output strain that's mutated. What happens if you put it back into new gerbils? And we found that when we put this output strain in, it caused very little gastritis. The complemented strain was in between, but the most important result was shown here in this colored plot. The red is cancer the blue is dysplasia, the green is no dysplasia, and you could see we ended up with all of these animals had no cancer. And when we looked at the complemented, there were a few that had dysplasia only. So this provided some idea that DFMO may have this sort of off-target effect where in addition to blocking polyamine synthesis, it actually attenuates the virulence of the bacteria. And we went on to show in this study that perhaps it was causing oxidative stress and mutations through that mechanism. So the study designed for our aflornithine trial, um, again, that was funded by NCI, was we worked in Honduras and um, Puerto Rico, um, and we enrolled uh, about 86 patients in Honduras, and then we did this aggressive plan of repeat endoscopy at six months, 18 months, and then uh, a, a respite from treatment, and then six months later, further assessment. And we, we obtained all these samples. Our primary endpoint was DNA damage, immunohistochemistry. We also, secondary endpoint at six months. Secondary endpoints are the later time points as well as the histology uh, scoring. So Blanca Piazuelo scored all of this, and all of the data is currently sitting with the uh, chair of biostats at Vanderbilt. We also were supported in this by cancer prevention pharmaceuticals that provided the uh, DFMO. Okay, so what other things are we working on that could lead to things that could help patients? So we worked with spermine oxidase deficient mice. Again, this is the enzyme that uh, causes oxidative stress and, and aldehyde generation. And we found that there was a modest decrease in inflammation and in neutrophils. And when we looked at myeloperoxidase staining for myeloid cells, there was less infiltrating MPO positive cells. And there was actually a concomitant increase in bacterial burden because there's less uh, innate immune response. So we made mouse gastric organoids from these animals. And what we show here is this punctate nuclear staining for phospho H2AX, a marker of uh, DNA damage. And you can see it was greatly attenuated with H. pylori stimulation in the Smox knockout mice, which we quantified here. And then, we, oops. And then we did flow cytometry and saw a similar result. And this data right here I'm about to show you is very exciting to me. Um, we spent several years back crossing the C57 black 6 Smox deficient mouse onto the FVBN background, and then onto the INSGAS transgenic. So let me explain. The black six mice do not get cancer if you just infect them, no matter how long you wait. The INSGAS is a, is a transgene that causes overexpression of human gastrin in the stomach of mice. And the funny thing is if you do that on the black six background, they don't get dysplasia or cancer. So they have to be FVBN. So you have to do 10 generation back cross and then add in the transgene. And basically what these data show, if we focus on the infected animals in these two, is that there's a decrease in the SMOX deficient INSGAS mice in the extent of dysplasia and cancer. Each symbol is a different mouse. And when we did this stack plot of the global diagnosis, green is no dysplasia, yellow is low grade, and red is intramucosal carcinoma, you can see there was a dramatic attenuation in the cancer development. 
And here's just representative images of IMC at high power shown here, and this is low-grade dysplasia in the knockout. So we're still trying to understand the mechanism of this. We're doing a lot of work to try and figure that out. So another project we worked on that's related is we created an epithelial-specific knockout of ornithine decarboxylase in the uh, mouse stomach. Uh, we had to do that because total knockout of ornithine decarboxylase is lethal. And here's immunostaining immunofluorescence showing a lot of ODC in the epithelium of infected floxed control mice versus the knockout. And PMSS1 is the strain of H. pylori. And you can see the expansion of the mucosa with infection. This is C57 black six mice. And then in the flocks mice, you can see a crypt abscess here. But in the knockout, there was less expansion of the mucosa, less inflammation. And when we scored the gastritis, there was an obvious reduction. And um, uh, Blanca scored for us the parietal cell loss, and we actually found that it was significantly attenuated in the delta epi mice. And um, we did staining for KI67, which is a marker of proliferation. And I think you can clearly see, even at the low power, that the band of cells that are proliferating is reduced in the delta epi mice. And this is seen on the high power. And we quantified this uh, shown here. So that's important because ODC is th theoretically the target of the DFMO, but we want to prove it at the molecular level. So now what we're doing is we're crossing these onto the INSCAS mice, and that also took about two years, and we're about to start those experiments. So another pathway I just want to mention briefly that's another potential uh, area of intervention is something called hypusination. So what in the world is that? So spermidine is the substrate for an enzyme called deoxyhypusine synthase, and it adds uh, a part of spermidine onto only one molecule in nature, which is EIF5A, which is a translational um, uh, protein. And when you get hypusinated EIF5A, it goes to the nucleus, binds to mRNAs with specific target sequences, takes them and escorts them to the ribosome where they can facilitate protein synthesis. So one of the things we've been doing is working with gastric organoid lines. These are, these are not from infected patients. They're just normal controls. And this is data from the corpus. We've seen similar data in the antrum. And what you can see here is when we infected with H. pylori, plus or minus an inhibitor of hypusination, that there was a big reduction in the pink of the number of upregulated proteins caused by H. pylori and an increase in the downregulated proteins. And when we looked at disease function, a lot of them do relate to just uh, protein synthesis, uh, but we still think this is interesting. And when we did a heat map analysis, we found a number of interesting targets that have been implicated in oncogenesis, including the ones I'm showing here. And we've been confirming some of these by Western blotting. And we've been making an epithelial-specific knockout of DHPS, and experiments are ongoing for that. We published a paper in 2020 looking at macrophage hypusination in contrast to epithelial, and we got a shocking result that a lot of um, antimicrobial proteins and also autophagy-related proteins like sequestosome were potently downregulated in macrophages generated from these knockout mice and we found a number of immune pathways that were altered when we looked at proteomics. So another target area that we've worked on is we had a paper in gut in 2018 looking at EGF receptor signaling, and we've also published before that that EGFR phosphorylation is upregulated in the myeloid cells in the stomach. This paper was focused on epithelium, and we gave a drug called gefitinib, which is an inhibitor of EGFR, and we found that in the gerbils shown here, there was nearly a 50% reduction in cancer and less DNA damage. And here are some representative images, and there were less inflammatory markers. In the INSGAS mouse model that I've just told you about, when we gave gefitinib, again, the red is cancer. In this case, the blue is dysplasia, and the green is, is no dysplasia. And we lost the red, pretty much, with the gefitinib and the extent of dysplasia was decreased, and the inflammation was decreased. 
Okay, so a newer area that we got into, so I've told you about blocking polyamines, I told you about blocking EGFR. We just published a paper on another pathway. So when polyamines are made, they use this uh, s adenosyl methionine, uh, which is derived from methionine, and you need this enzyme um, SAMDC to generate the polyamines. But there's a competing pathway, which is called the reverse transsulfuration pathway. And basically what happens is SAM is the substrate for homocysteine, and then this enzyme cystothionine gamma lyase converts cystothionine into cysteine. And there's a lot of interest in this metabolic pathway in all different types of disease. So we decided to look at this. We obtained um, CTH-deficient mice from Solomon Snyder, Johns Hopkins, who's a famous neurobiologist. And what we show here by immunostaining is the, um, the green is CTH, the red is macrophages, and the double staining orangey yellow cells are the double staining cells with infection. And when we use the knockout mouse, the double staining cells disappeared. And when we infect a wild-type mouse, and this is data from eight weeks of infection, we saw the same thing at four weeks and the same thing at 16 weeks. There's this big expansion of the mucosa that was attenuated in the CTH-deficient mouse. The cryptapsises and such were basically gone in the knockout. And when we scored the gastritis, here's the data from the eight and 16 weeks, it was reduced in the CTH-deficient mice. And there was a concomitant increase in colonization due to the attenuated immune response. We did RNA sequencing on gastric macrophages isolated from the infected wild type and knockout mice, and we saw a lot of immune system process activation, uh, which is shown in these colors up here compared to the very cold uh, CTH knockout um, cells. So in considering the duality of the macrophage, this is a very controversial topic. Every time I try and write a paper, some reviewer tells me, no, 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 you're not using the right classification system. But the reality is, I still think talking about classically activated antimicrobial M1 antitumoral macrophages is a very useful terminology. And the M2, also known as alternatively activated or regulatory macrophages, which tend to be more anti-inflammatory but also associated with tumorigenesis. Um, so we did a bunch of uh, studies looking at macrophages from these CTH mice, and we found that some of the classic pro-inflammatory M1 cytokines were dramatically reduced with H. pylori stimulation, and there was less NOS2 and less NO generated. And then my student, um, Yvonne, did a lot of uh, seahorse assays, and we looked at different metabolic pathways, and we saw disturbance of the uh, immunometabolism such that it was generally suppressed in the CTH knockout mice. So you could argue, would you want to give a patient a drug that would wipe out some of these immunometabolic activation patterns? I would say when it comes to H. pylori, probably yes, because we know that we can't successfully eradicate everyone. But unfortunately, right now, there is no CTH inhibitor that can be given to a patient. But our speculation at the end of this paper was that if you knock out CTH, you reduce glycolysis, oxfos, and gene transcription, and we got less gastritis, less NF-kappa B activation, less cytokine generation. So we thought this was a pretty exciting finding, and um, we're crossing these onto the INSGAS mouse, too. Um, and I want to end with this story. So for the last five years or so, we've been working on this idea of electrophiles. These are products of lipid peroxidation that occur throughout the body, and these are very reactive aldehyde molecules. So levaglandin, malondialdehyde, acrolein, and 4-ONE. And we worked with John Oates and his group at Vanderbilt, who had developed an electrophile scavenger called 5-ethyl-2-hydroxybenzylamine, or ETHOBA. And the concept is that if you could use a scavenger, you could reduce the damaging effects of these products of lipid peroxidation that we think are crucial in causing almost any type of cancer, including H. pylori-induced cancer, um, particularly that acrolein comes from smocks. So we had a paper in gastro in 2021 in which we stained 
tissues from patients with precancerous lesions and found a stepwise increase by immunohistochemistry of the generation of these acrolein, sorry, isolevoglandin adducts. And you can see the nuclear staining in intestinal metaplasia. And then these are data from INSGAS mice, and we took pictures, and we, you can see the thickened stomach with HP that was attenuated with this ET HOBA. We could show that we could measure the drug by mass spec in the tissue. We could see reduction in the adducts. There wasn't much of an effect on inflammation, but here was the exciting data. Um, intramucosal carcinoma was reduced from 10 cases to one. The LGD was reduced in half. And there was the extent of dysplasia and cancer was reduced. And here's representative pictures of the very thickened, distorted, dysplastic stomach that was reduced with the drug. And we actually used some live animal imaging of 18 fluoride sodium fluoride uptake uh, by PET CT. And this is a marker of oncogenesis. And it was reduced in the mice receiving the drug. We then went to the gerbil model and showed, again, protection from cancer development with this drug given in the drinking water. Um, and here's a representative invasive gland, and we didn't see that in the knockout, I'm sorry, in the animal treated with the drug. We did staining for um, DNA damage, and you can see all this strong nuclear staining with H. pylori that was reduced with the animals treated with ET HOBA, and we scored that here. And uh, in response to a question from the reviewer, we showed double staining that the isolevoglandin adducts appeared to be in pretty much the same cells as the DNA damage positive cells. We did whole exome sequencing on tissues from these mice, and we found that there, this is an onco, well, there were more uh, SNPs in the untreated animals than the HOBA treated animals. And then in the animals treated with ET HOBA on this onca plot, there were a lot less mutations. So the very end of the story is that we've been now working with the parent drug, which is 2-hydroxybenzylamine or 2-HOBA. And what's really exciting about this is, A, it's a natural product from buckwheat seeds. B, it's been through phase one clinical trials at Vanderbilt showing that it's safe. And we have an STTR grant from the NCI to develop this drug for potential commercialization and cancer treatment. And this is with MTI Biotech in Iowa. So our protocol is that INSGAS mice were inoculated with H. pylori. After seven days, they were started with hope, two hope in the drinking water, euthanized at day 56. We showed the drug was bioavailable in the stomach. These are the doses of the drug. But it did seem like in the infected animals, the drug levels decreased, suggesting that maybe it was metabolized. And there was um, no effect on colonization, but the, oh, oops. but the gastritis was reduced. And when we did our usual stack plots, uh, we found that there wasn't really any effect in the uninfected mice. But in the infected, there was a nice protection from uh, intramucosal carcinoma and dysplasia in a concentration-dependent manner. And the same thing happened with the um, extent of dysplasia in cancer. So we can't really go much above this three milligram per ml dose because the animals at that point won't drink it because it doesn't taste very good. Um, obviously in people, it's given as a capsule. Um, briefly, in terms of the histology, let's focus on the right side of this. The H. pylori infection in a dose-wise manner, you can see the reduced thickening of the mucosa. Here's the intramucosal carcinoma with the yellow arrows, which was attenuated. When we looked at inflammatory markers, um, we saw that with these classic markers like IL-1, TNF, NOS2, CXCL1, IL-17, and interferon gamma, in a dose-dependent manner, they were decreased in the gastric tissues. When we stained for DNA damage, we saw here's this strong staining of the nuclei, and it was reduced with the high dose, and uh, we got a significant reduction. So in conclusion, I think that H. pylori-induced gastric cancer has many molecular mechanisms. And the work in my lab, which we're hoping to, you know, use these preclinical studies to lead to clinical studies, suggests these potential targets. Polyamine synthesis, ODC, DFMO, metabolism, which would be the hypusination and spermine oxidase. And we're working with a collaborator to test a number of novel SMOX inhibitors. The immunometabolism angle, which would be CTH, 
EGFR signaling, and then now our most exciting thing, we think, is the scavenging of reactive aldehydes because we have a clinically available drug. So I'll stop there. I want to just acknowledge uh, people from my lab, lab alumni, lots of collaborators around the country and the world, um, lots of people at Vanderbilt that have uh, helped us do these studies. Doug, who's now uh, at UAB, who worked with me on the clinical trial and other studies that we've done in Honduras, and various funding support. So thank you.